Okay, let's get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I do see some faces I recognize. Uh, my name is Edwin. Until very recently, I worked for uh, Netronome, and uh, Netronome makes a particular uh, type of network interface card for servers. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll start. It's a small room, so you know, if there are any questions, please do stop me during the talk, and we can we can go wherever we need to go with it, right? I've got some slides, but I don't care if I go through the slides or not. So you know, if, if there's something else interesting to talk about, we can do that instead. Um, so first, a quick, trick question, right? So if you've got a dual core, um, uh, well, SMP-based Intel server with 24 cores in a in a CPU, how many CPUs do you have in your server? So if you have a, a SMP machine yes. with two processors populated, each with 24 sockets. two sockets, yeah, each with 24 cores, how many CPUs do you have in your server? A minimum of uh, 48. That's not excluding your rest of the peripherals. Right, and that that's kind of the point, right? So there there are actually many many more CPUs in your server than you might than you might first you know be apparent as. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll have management engines in the CPU that are running firmware that you don't control. You'll have a, a baseboard management controller on the motherboard that runs some firmware that you don't control, um, often running Linux there. And my particular domain of interest over the last seven years has been network interface cards. And if you have the Netronome card, you have up to 120 cores, CPU cores, in the network interface alone. So that's what I want to talk about today. Um, We've recently, I say we, uh, forgive me, I'm still used to being a Netronomite or whatever you want to call them. Um, recently open sourced the firmware for our, um, what we call Cornic. So Cornic is a firmware load for, for the Netronome interface card that, that has a network processor on the card, right? So it's a, it's a fairly general purpose processor in the sense that it executes instructions that do whatever the software tells it to do. Um, but it's got a lot of little bits and pieces that are sort of optimized for networking and, and to make things very efficient for packet processing. So some of the things that this particular software load does, so it's firmware that you load onto the card at runtime, um, is all the standard kind of NIC type of things. So you know, in its most basic form, it passes packets. And a packet comes in on the wire, it ends up on the PCI interface, and a packet goes out the PCI interface and ends up on the wire. That's, that's the core of it. But there's a lot of other clever things that it does too. So, um, you know, any modern NIC worth its salt will do um, various stateless um, uh, offloads, like uh, check some offload for TCP and UDP, so that the host core doesn't have to, the host CPU doesn't have to calculate those things. Um, you'll do things like receive side scaling, where you have the network interface card select different queues for delivering packets to the host, so that the packets go to different cores, so that you can balance your load over your your host CPU cores. Um, you'll do TCP segmentation offload, which allows you to send larger than MTU pieces of data to the network card and have the network card split them up into TCP segments at MTU size. So those are all sort of the, the traditional, and, and then SRIV is also pretty common on, on most network interface cards where you'll be able to do the virtualization. You'll have a virtual ethernet bridge inside the, the NIC, which you can then configure either VLANs or, <coughs> excuse me, um, a, a Mac lookup table, and then you can have um, packets delivered directly into the VM's memory uh, via SRIV. So these are fairly basic things. Um, the Netronome NIC does some other interesting things. Um, BPF offload is something that we introduced. So you, I don't know how many of you are familiar with eBPF. Hands. There's one, two. So. Um, one of the nice things you can do in the Linux kernel these days is you can attach little bits of programs from user space in various parts of the kernel infrastructure, including in the network stack. So, so in the network driver, you can run a piece of custom code to do things before an SKB is allocated and before a packet ends up in the kernel to do various things. You might do load balancing, you might be doing filtering, all, all sorts of things like that. And what we do is we take that, that same program and we jit it and we run it on the NIC. So you can actually now run that stuff on the NIC before the packet transfers over PCI, you've already got some, some ability to do some packet processing on the packet. And more recently, this is not even in the upstream repo yet, um, we'll be there one of these days, um, KTLS offloads. So we offload crypto um, onto the NIC um, CPU. So this stuff is all available upstream in, in Linux firmware. Um, and recently, the source code is, is available on GitHub. 
uh, for, for this core NIC load. We call it core NIC because it does basic NIC functionality. So why did we open source it? Well, then there's, you know, there's a couple of reasons. Um, the first one's the obvious one. We're at an open source conference. It's the, the many eyeballs make all bug shallow argument, right? If, if more people are looking at the code, hopefully we end up with better code. Um, that, that's the obvious thing. But this is, this is the other big one. If you've got um, you know, serious hyperscalers doing uh, networking at, at a large scale, they need to know that they can trust the software running on that NIC. And the only way you can give them that confidence is to give them access to the software, right? Um, on, on, the one argument that they make is, you know, scale it down, make the NIC as dumb as possible to do as little as possible to minimize the attack surface, but that then limits the features of the device. So, you know, the, the alternative is to, is to make it open source. And, and one of the other big motivations is to try and reduce the time that, that such large uh, um, uh, operators can respond to zero-day vulnerabilities because the issue they have is now they need to trust the vendor of the networking equipment to, to fix the security bug. And, you know, that may take longer than they're, accept, they're, they're prepared to accept. So that, that is one of the reasons why you want to give customers the ability to modify and build the code themselves on the device. Um, there's the obvious marketing benefits to open sourcing things. I'm standing here today talking to you about Netronome firmware. Um, most of you have probably never heard about Netronome. So, you know, open sourcing does that for you. Um, but the other interesting thing, this is my personal interest, is um, discovering the interesting applications for network cards that we don't think of. Um, I, I don't know what people want to do with this device, right? Maybe they're doing some weird routing thing eliminate switches or, you know, there's all sorts of weird things people can do with the, with the hardware that, that you don't necessarily think about productizing as a company until you see somebody doing it and, and then you can work with them to discover those niches and, and figure out what you can build with the product. Um, this is also something cool, um, this, is, this is a belief of mine as well, is that developing out in the open makes you a better developer. You do things more properly that way. <laughs> So you're going to take less shortcuts because your name is attached to it out in the open and people can see it. Um, so from that perspective, I think it's, it's really important that, you know, it, it, working on open source gives you the ability to take a different kind of pride in your work. It's not just doing your work for a paycheck. People can see it and, and you want to put your best work out there because people can see it. And then, of course, you know, if we start seeing people hacking on our network cards, that's, you know pretty good chance that we'll be interested in talking to that person to, to hire them. So that, that's, uh, these are all the kind of motivations for open source. It actually makes sense for corporations to, to open source software because of these reasons, right? And I mean, that's, that's clear. A lot of people are doing that now. Um, internally at Netronome, um, it's an interesting open source process. The company has a weekly open source call where all engineers are invited to attend, discussing you know, whatever's of open source interest to the company at the time. And with specifics to um, getting projects approved for open source release, there's a very formal process of writing up a charter for the project um, that, that covers things like the scope and why we should open source this piece of software and you know, what license are we going to choose for it and why. All of those things need to be motivated in a document um, and with explicit like who, who out of the engineering team is allowed to write code and submit code to the open source project. So, so you know, the, these list of engineers are authors, they write the code for the software, um, they need to be approved and understand what the constraints of the scope are, and then the people approving particular patches released to open source must be a different person from the person who wrote it. So the review must always be a second person. So, so there's, there's pretty stringent criteria around that. Um, we have a lot of process around uh, making sure we comply with other open source licenses, so we don't want to accidentally include somebody's GPL code. Uh, not very likely for NIC firmware, but you know there, there are other projects that are, are, say, running on the host stack or something DPDK or these kind of things. So we've, we've gone to a lot of effort to actually document licenses properly in all the source files um, using SPDX tags. And we also do the, the, the due diligence of scanning through the software with automated um, uh, composition analysis tools to check, you know, did somebody plagiarize some code that you didn't intend and that kind of thing. So, 
So you need to do that kind of stuff. Um, in terms of development process, we try to model the upstream kernel process as far as possible. Um, we know it works, we know it scales. Um, so we have a, a mailing list where patches for, for Cornic are submitted. Um, they get reviewed on the mailing list, discussed on the mailing list, um, using all the, the usual uh, tags you'll see on, on uh, kernel commits. And really trying to follow this upstream first mantra, um, because the problem that happens is you, you get a, a customer requirement and you create a new branch of the repo and you know, just hack something together to solve the customer's problem and now you've got two code bases to maintain. And by, by following the upstream first principle, you actually, A, you don't have that, that two code bases to maintain, but the second thing you get is it forces you to think about the architecture up front because you now, you now have to modify the, the global thing and you need to make sure that you do that in a way that, that is sustainable and makes sense architecturally. And that doesn't always happen when people are doing something in a private repo or private branch. Um, so, you know, you really want to try and, try and enforce that as much as possible. So, enough about the, the open source. Now I want to get into a little bit about um, the capabilities of the device. Maybe scare you a little bit um, by, by the kinds of things it can do. Uh, I have one more thing. Okay, so, so these are just some, some additional challenges we had in open sourcing the NIC firmware specifically. Um, one of them is our tool chain for building software for the NIC is not open, and we can't make it open. We are constrained by third-party licenses. So, so that was a, a fairly involved process to figure out a way that we can distribute that legally to people so that they can at least build the stuff. It doesn't help you release the code and people can't build it, right? So you, ha you have to be able to provide the tools, so we've, we've got a way to do that now. Unfortunately, that's not open source, but you know, we, we do what we can do. Um, it was also pretty important for me to, um, to release the entire Git history for the project. So I didn't want to just throw the latest release over the wall, and now you, you sit with this wall of code that you don't understand context and history and how things got there. Um, also speaking to that developer pride motivation, right? You want to have that commit history that you can say, okay, look, I did that work. Um, so, it's, so it's good to have that there. But we had a bunch of poor quality commit messages in the history that had to get cleaned up, and we had a bunch of references to internal bug trackers and things like that that we tried to filter out before we, before we released it. Some files in the repo didn't have the correct copyright notices when we did that compliance audit, so you know, those had to be fixed and they had to be fixed in the history. So, so we did do some history rewriting, but at least the full project history is there, which is, which is nice. Um, another big challenge for us is the instruction set architecture of the Netronome um, processor is proprietary, right? It's not, it's not something a lot of people are familiar with. So this is one of the things where, you know, hopefully in a talk like today, where I can tell you a bit about it, you know, just whet the appetite so you, you want to learn more about it, because it is different. It's not, it's not the same as what you're used to. I mean, it's, it's not written in C. Um, we have a C compiler, and some parts of the code are written in C, but the really performance-critical parts are written in the, in the assembly language for the part, because we need the best performance at these, at these kind of packets. I mean, we're dealing with hundreds of millions of packets per second that, that we process on the thing. So it's, you know, you, you need it very, very, <coughs> excuse me, tuned and optimized for that purpose. Yes, certainly. Uh, what processor is that you may answer? It's the Netronome flow processor, the NFP. I'll, the next slide is a picture of it and give you an idea of what, what parts make it up. Another problem that we have and we still have with this particular repo is, um, you know, we're a small startup working, you know, moving fast. The documentation is not always quite as good as it should be. Um, and at some point, um, you know, made the call, let's release it and get it out there, even though the documentation is not yet up to scratch. So that is, um, you know, one of the challenges we face. Um, I saw an interesting talk at the, um, at this open source conference that I was at a few weeks ago, and uh, an interesting mechanism for doing this is ask new contributors to the project to start by writing some documentation. It's an interesting idea. Is, uh, that solves that problem and it helps people learn um, the code base that they're working on. All right, so here's a schematic of what the Netronome flow processor looks like. This is a, 
specifically that part number, the NFP6, and then there's various different things that go in the XXX, but they all are based on this piece of silicon. And the first thing to note is all these little black squares, those are processing cores, CPUs essentially, right? There are 120 of them on this diagram. Each of them running, you know, somewhere around a gigahertz with a pretty powerful instruction set for doing all sorts of interesting things. The other thing is you notice that these things are all, each little block here in the silicon um, is a physical island that is deployable and composable in different ways depending on how you want to instantiate the particular silicon spin that you do. So this one has, has seven general purpose flow processing islands and then some islands that are um, you know, focused on security, crypto, AES, these kind of things. Um, these are, are Mac blocks that do um, packet ingress from using a network interface and then there's PCI blocks that do interaction with a PCI interface and then there's things that interact with DRAM. Um, and, uh, so, and, and all of these individual islands are then interconnected using a distributed switch fabric on the die. So something running on this core here can address the memory there over this fabric and read and write data or do execute commands on the memories. Um, the memories themselves are quite interesting. So there's, there's something called an internal memory unit and then there's something called an external memory unit. Um, they're very, very similar. The external memory units just have external DRAM backing them and then they have uh, an amount of SRAM on the part. I think it's like three megabytes of SRAM that can be configured as a cache for the DRAM. And then the internal memory units have, in this case, four megabytes of, of internal SRAM. So you've got some on-chip memory for doing things that are accessed frequently or you need to do at high speed. And then these memories are, are processing memories or transactional, transactional memory was a, has other connotations. So they're processing memories. They do, they do interesting things. So there's little engines in the memory unit that can assist you assist your program doing things for packet processing. So for example, there are some, there's something called a lookup engine that can, with a single command, execute a hash lookup, for example. Um, there are, there's a queue engine that allows you to implement circular rings, for example, very efficiently in hardware. So you can just say, put something on a ring, and then something else can pop it off the ring. Or you can do work queues and these kind of things. So, so these are, are pretty powerful memories. There's an atomic unit that can do in a single command, a read, modify, update of something, um, which is pretty awesome, right? So th these are things that the memories do asynchronously to the processors. So it's this like asynchronous processing model that you have to get your head around. Um, the PCI stuff is not baked into hardware. It's actually software controlled as well. So you have software running on these cores whose responsibility is managing the PCI interface. Everything from like what are the, the descriptors that go over the PCI look like. The, the software will pack the descriptors out and allocate buffers and do all the necessary to, uh, uh, you know, marshal DMAs to, to read packets from the host or write packets to host memory. That's all software controlled in the PCI islands. Um, so I don't want to get into too much more detail on that. Um, perhaps, perhaps just a little bit on the Mac. Um, so there's uh, on Ingress. There's a hardware packet characterizer that will parse the packet headers of, of incoming packets and determine, for example, that it's an IPv4 or an IPv6 packet, whether it's TCP, whether there was a VXLAN tunnel, whether, you know, what were the offsets of all the various headers. Um, these are the kind of things that the, the characterizer in conjunction with these more CPUs, th these are scaled down cores that are much more limited than these cores, but they are optimized for doing this kind of header parsing stuff. So you can actually write software to parse the packet headers and to figure out, you know, if you need to support new protocols that are, you know, don't even exist today, you would you'd be able to update software running in these packet processing cores to be able to interpret those, those protocol headers. So it's pretty cool. Um, and then on egress, um, there's a couple of interesting things. There's a, a traffic manager that can do queuing and um, quality of service kind of things. Um, there's a um, packet modifier component that does streaming edits of packets. So you can, before you send the packet out, you can write a script in the buffer that says, 
at that offset, delete so many bytes, at this offset, insert so many bytes with these values so that you can do streaming editing of packets on the, on the way egressing the system. And then there's also a reorder block. Um, and the reason we have that there is, and this is again a software choice, but often we will choose to um, process packets out of order. So, so one of the, the jobs of these processing cores is also to load balance packets to the various islands in the chip when, you, when you're processing, uh, when, when you receive the packets, so that you can process, you can distribute the processing over all of these different cores. And we, we just spray them out, and now they, they, there's no synchronization necessarily between these cores. So you're processing the packets out of order, and then when they go back out the interface, you want to put them back in order again as they came in on the wire, and that's what this reorder block does. So, so one of the things that you'll do is you'll stamp the packet with a, with a sequence number when it comes in, and then when you egress the packet, you'll queue them up and resequence them before you, before you send them out. Okay, so, so that's what the hardware looks like. Um, in terms of the Cornic firmware itself, um, this is what the software architecture looks like for Cornic. So we have the, the sort of traditional separation between something that is control plane and something that is data plane. So the control plane um, interacts with the host driver, and if you turn on features or off features, or you, um, you know, link state changes, it will then go and notify the driver, link went up, link went down, that kind of thing. Um, it will aggregate statistics. So one of the things that happens while you're processing packets is you might count various events. You, you may count when you drop a packet, for example, and the data plane might go and update that in a small, fast local memory, and then the, um, the app master, as we call it, will go and aggregate those statistics into something that it can populate the host with so that it has all the st stats aggregated. You might have smaller counters that wrap there and bigger counters that don't wrap there, these kind of things. So, so that's all the control plane kind of things. Uh, I don't think I want to get into too much of the detailed architecture other than to say um, the packet processing is, is run on an, it's kind of an, an interpreter that's implemented in the software. So you get these little actions that you can execute on a packet and an action might be drop or send a packet to that interface or pick a, a queue for RSS. These are the kind of actions that you will execute. And those little actions are implemented in, in microcode, in finely tuned microcode, but they can be composed in various different ways by the control plane configuring policy in a, in a database of actions. So what we typically have is for each ingress queue into the system, we have a list of actions that must execute for packets that came in on that queue. And, and then those actions will be different depending on, on what policy you've implemented. Um, and yeah, I don't want to get too much into, uh, uh, can't get too much into details today, but that, that's like, you know, there's, there's plugins that do the EP, EBPF offload that I mentioned. Um, we have specific actions surrounding crypto. So you have a thing that says, take this packet and do TLS encrypt on it. Take this packet, do TLS decrypt on it. These are the kind of actions that you can do. In terms of the, the micro engines themselves, so that's the little, these little processing cores. We call them micro engines. Um, the instruction set architecture for that is risk-ish. Uh, it's the best way to describe it. Perhaps risky, I don't know. Um, so it's a fixed length instruction format. It's a 45-bit instruction. Um, there are only, I, I think there's 13 on a newer part, but there's only 12 instruction encodings for the NFP 6K. Um, so it is pretty, they are fairly simple instructions and there are few of them, so it kind of qualifies as risk from that perspective. Um, that translates into about 60 um, assembler mnemonics that you can call on to do various things with, with uh, you know, various instructions, and about 10 external commands. And external commands are, are just instructions that when you execute it on one of these cores, you're sending a command to one of these other islands, to a memory or to, to the Mac or to something, to do something on your behalf. And those commands happen asynchronously, and there's a, we'll get into how, how that happens in a minute. Um, the cores have a very large register set. I, I got a slide just now with, with what that looks like. So that's pretty risk style type thing, big, big register sets. Most of the instructions executed, execute in a single cycle. And um, 
It is a load store architecture in the sense that you have commands that you send to the memory that you can read and write to memory and have those. So when you do a read to memory, you'll end up with whatever you read from memory will end up in a set of special registers in the CPU. Um, and similarly, if you, you write to, to a register, you can then have those registers written out to memory with a, a memory write command, which is like a store. So it's kind of load store. Um, there are also some complex ops. So there, are, there is a CPU instruction for doing CRCs, for example. Um, there is a CPU instruction for doing CAM lookups, content addressable memory. So you, there's a small CAM inside each core. Um, it's like a tiny CAM, a 16 entry CAM or so, that you can do lookups based on, on a 32-bit content value, which can be useful for certain things. Um, it has a multiply, but that's not a single step instruction. That's a, you, you have to execute like four instructions, four multi steps to do a multiply, or three or four, depending on the, the size of the arguments. And these are quite useful in packet processing. There's um, load field, which will allow you to, to select an 8-bit, it's a 32-bit architecture, this, so the register's all 32-bit. But you know, often in packet processing, you need to access fields that are smaller than 32 bits. So there's, there's instructions to extract an 8-bit field out of a value. Um, and on more recent parts, there's a bit field to extract. You can tell it, extract the value from this least significant bit to that most significant bit. So if you've got like a 5-bit value somewhere in a descriptor that you want to read out, you can in a single instruction extract it out of the register. Um, the instructions themselves are uh, three operand. Um, so you, everything takes two registers and writes it to a register, or a register plus an immediate and writes it to a register. Um, there are several different addressing modes. So there's a, an absolute addressing mode where you can refer to any register on the CPU from a, from a given instruction. But there's also context relative addressing. So these, these little cores are hardware threaded. So they each have a, a subsection or a, a partition of the register set that each context can access, each thread can access. And there's context relative addressing for that. So you can run the same code on all the threads and they get their own set of registers automatically, which is kind of cool. And then there's also various uh, indexed addressing mode. The core is a Harvard machine, so that means the instructions are not stored with the data. They, they are stored in a separate memory. Um, each core has 8K instructions, so 8192 eight times 45-bit um, <coughs> instructions per core. And then there are ways, if you need more code stored, to, to share. If you're running the same code on a set of micro-engines, you can then share the code memory between them. There are some inefficiencies to doing that, but it allows you to have more code. So branches take longer, for example, and that kind of thing. But you can now take the, the code store from two neighboring micro-engines on the die, run the same code on them, and then share the code store and have you know, 16 and, on some parts, 32K to share between four micro-engines. Um, I already mentioned this. The registers are 32-bit. Um, so that's kind of behind the times. We're all 64-bit now, but you don't need a 64-bit machine for packet processing. And the advantage of that is that it's smaller in silicon, so that's great. Um, it's a banked architecture, so there are two banks of registers, and the instruction has an A operand and a B operand, and always the A operand has to come from the A bank, and the B operand has to come from the B bank. But there are 128 of these registers per bank, and if you... Um, split them per, per hardware thread, it's either 32 or 64, depending on whether you're running an 8-thread or 4-thread mode. On a, so you can have up to 8 threads, or you can run in 4-thread modes, but you have a bigger register set um, in 4-thread mode, which is kind of advantageous sometimes. And then I said the loading, loading and storing, the memory read and the memory write, um, those go to a special type of register. We call them transfer registers. Um, so there are 256 transfer in registers, so if you're doing a read, it must read into one of these transfer in registers, and if you're doing a write, you must write it out from a transfer out register. So you need to make sure that the result of your calculation that needs to be written to memory went into a transfer out register, for example. And then there's these weird things, next neighbor registers, and those are kind of funky. If you have the, the um, processing cores are, are configured in a ring, and you can write to a register in core number zero, and in the next cycle, you can read it in core number one. So if you want to build complicated synchronization mechanisms between cores, you can do that with these next neighbor registers. It's kind of funky. 
And then each of those cores has 1K of local memory, 1K words, so 4K of local memory. Um, and that is memory that is, it's almost as fast as registers. Literally, you can access them in a single cycle, that entire 1K, but you have to set up the index pointers to point to the right places in that memory. So there's a little bit of a setup latency, but then you can configure a, a thing to point at that local memory, and then you can read and write it in a single cycle, which is, which is really cool. And then there are mailboxes that you can write to that are useful for debugging um, and or synchronization things between, between different parts of the chip. How are we doing for time? Okay. Um, yep. Okay, sure. Uh, I already mentioned we have these um, hardware threads in the cores, so that's kind of cool. So each thread gets its own view of the register set, the subset of the registers, which is pretty handy. So you've got these per context register sets. And you can do context swaps in anything from zero to three cycles. So if you're doing a memory command, you can, in the same instruction that executes the command to the memory, you can actually swap out the thread. And with some tricks, you can actually execute some more instructions while it's loading the code for the next thread. So I'll, I'll get to that in a second with the, with the, the pipeline details. Um, but that's pretty cool. So you can actually do a, a thread swap in no cycles. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, and then, the, as I said, the, these commands that you execute on these other parts of the chip, on the memories or on the, the Macs, or the, you know, the, the, they are running asynchronously. So you will execute a command, and then typically you'll swap out and run another thread. And then at some point, the command completes, and then you get signaled back that says, okay, the command's completed. And, excuse me, each thread can have like 15 of these signals outstanding at any given time. So you can fire off 15 commands to memories to do cool things, and then you can swap out and wait for them all to come back, and then you've got all your, all your results. So that's, that's pretty cool. So how that looks in practice, this is just a, a taster of what the assembly language looks like, just so that you see it's not all that difficult. So if you wanted to read something from memory, for example, you would execute a mem instruction, and then the memory supports a number of subcommands that it can do. So one of those is read. I want to read something from memory. Um, read actually, this is not correct, it should be read 32 to read a single 32-bit value. Um, by default, read reads 64 bits. So <laughs> um, but you know, I didn't try and compile this. I just wrote the slide. Um, the, these, remember I said there's these transfer registers that you have to read things into? So that's designated with a dollar in front of the register name. So this is a register named value that we want to read something into. So that's also kind of cool. The assembler does register allocation. You don't have to know which physical register things are going into, you just tell it, I want a register, and I'm putting this semantic concept in the register. I'm putting the IP version, or the whatever. I'm, it's like a variable name like, that you would do in, in another language. You just name your registers whatever you want, and the assembler figures out live, and, live range analysis to figure out you know, how long is this register live, and then when it's not live anymore, it can reuse that register for something else, and all that kind of stuff. So that, that's pretty kind of cool. It makes, it, it makes writing in the assembly language almost as easy as writing C, which is kind of cool. And then um, the memories, or at least the, the internal switch fabric that busts between all these different islands on the chip, um, that has a 40-bit addressing scheme. So we have 32-bit registers, and we have 40-bit addresses, so that means we need to actually use two registers to, to build an address up. And what happens is it takes whatever you pass here, shifts it left by eight, and then adds it to that to build your 40-bit address. So it can be kind of nice if you align your data structures properly in memory. You make sure that that thing is 256 byte aligned, and then you have a base plus an offset into your structure which is kind of cool, so you can access structures that way uh, in a convenient way. And then this is the, the size of the operation, the reference count, as they call it. So you can also read multiple registers. You could read up to 32-bit 32, 32 registers in a single read by, by, okay, it's not as simple as putting a 32 there, because you can only, put, you can only encode 
eight in the instruction and there's a separate way to encode bigger numbers, but you, you can read up to 32 registers or write 32 registers in a single command. And this is an example of what happens with the threading. So then you say context swap on some and you give a name to the signal, the same way you name a register. Um, so you might name that sig value or something or whatever you want to do. And uh, then this, this thread will swap out at that point and another thread will start executing in this, in this space. And at some point when that read command completes, you'll end up with the values in the register. And if you wanted to say, for example, add one, this is just an example. So if we wanted to add one to the value and store it back in a write transfer register now. And then we could write the value back to memory in a very similar way. Okay, so that's a load, do something with it, store. Okay, pretty simple. But you wouldn't do that. We have smart processing memories. And the memory has an atomic unit. And the atomic unit can do an increment, for example. So you wouldn't actually execute a value, value plus one, and then write it back again. You just go and tell the memory, hey, at that address, add one to it. Let me know when you're done. Okay, so that's, the model of thinking is different. You have these memories that can do very, very smart things. Um, the pipeline is an exposed pipeline. So what that means is you actually need to be aware of how long certain instructions take to execute in terms of latencies, for example. And it also exposes um, the defer slots. So remember I said you can do other useful work when you swap out, for example. Um, same with a branch. If you're going to branch somewhere, it has to load code at the branch destination. And that depends on whether the branch is taken or not. So usually that would result in a pipeline stall on a, on a traditional CPU. And while they spend a lot of time putting in effort into branch prediction, um, this thing has no branch predictor. So you just, you, you are able to, um, for example, if you're doing this conditional branch, so this is conditional on whatever the previous ALU calculation was. So we're gonna, on, on this condition, we're gonna branch to something that says process the layer four of the packet. So you've got a label that says process layer four. And then we say defer three slots. So when I put three more instructions after the branch, the branch decision happens there, but it keeps executing. It keeps executing whatever's in the pipeline. So as long as you've got useful work to do that the branch decision doesn't depend on. So, so when I get to processing L4, I might want to know what is the offset in the IP header of the protocol that we're processing for L4, for example. And um, so if I wanted to calculate that, I could, if I had, for example, the IP version in a register, so again, this is a semantic name for the register, then I might take 13 and subtract the version because that protocol field in the IP6 header and the IP4 header is in a different place. Um, and for IPv6, that's the correct offset for the thing. So we, sorry, sorry, for IPv4, that would be the correct offset. So it's an offset um, 13 minus 4. So byte offset 9 of the IP header is where the protocol field is. And then for IPv6, say we had the IP version there again, we'll exploit the fact that, the, that 6 in binary has a 1 set in the second bit. So we'll shift it right 1. So you see this, this, instru this ALU instruction is quite powerful. It can do a, a shift and an and in one cycle. It's kind of cool. Um, so we'll take the IP version, shift it right 1, and it with 1. So this is going to be 1 if and only if IP version is 6. It's going to be 0 if it's 4. Um, and then we subtract the other one which gets us to the offset 6 for IPv6 header. So that's kind of cool. So these instructions will execute um, whether or not the branch is taken. And that, that, that's how you can fill the pipeline stages there. Um, <coughs> other instructions I said you had to know the latency. So for example, if you're writing to one of those index registers for indexed addressing, you know, something called t-index which indexes the transfer registers, um, you could tell it which register you want to address, but now this updating local um, CSRs in the, in the core takes three cycles. You have to know that. So you, you have to wait three cycles before you can actually use the index register. Now you could go and put other useful work here, as long as that work didn't, this didn't depend on this work. So that's why it's nice to have that exposed pipeline, because you can now fill that time that would otherwise be stalls or waits in another CPU, you can fill it with useful work. And that's kind of cool. Um, and then there, you know, there's ways to encode more bits. So the instruction can code an immediate shift of up to 31 bits there. But say you wanted to get the shift value from another register, 
Well, f there are ways to, to actually use the previous instruction to tell you what is the shift for the next instruction. So there's these kind of multi-instruction multi sequences that you can do to, to do some more advanced things. And as I said, things like multiply, you'd, you'd execute multiple instructions for that. Byte align is another thing that is sometimes useful when, you, when you're reading things in 32-bit registers, but you want to byte offset into a thing. You can actually have instructions that can align the stuff correctly for you, which is kind of cool. Okay, time? One minute. Okay, so some other interesting oddities about the instruction, about the machine. Um, there's no interrupts, except for a debug interrupt, but don't worry about that. Um, so your code runs until you, it's a cooperative multi-threading thing, until you swap out and then something else will run. Um, there's no stack, which makes things fun for compiled languages. Essentially that means Generally, everything gets inlined. Uh, in the assembler, we have a thing called macros that, lets, that look more or less like functions um, with their own namespace and, and that kind of thing. Um, you can do subroutine calls, um, but it's, it's a little bit clumsy and clunky because there's no calling convention for how do you pass parameters to the thing. So you typically have to pass the parameters in either a global register or inside local memory or something like that. Um, but you can branch to a subroutine Load, and this is again now, I know the branch is going to happen, but you know, there's more work I can do before the branch actually happens and starts loading code there. Let's put the return address in a register in that the first slot, and then it executes the subroutine here, and when I return to the return address, it starts executing there again. And then the thing is also dual Indian. So the memories, you can tell it to read big Indian or read little Indian, you know, all these fun things. Um, It'll take five minutes to talk about the memory hierarchy. So the other thing is that you do is you have different types of memories all over the chip. So we have something called CTM, which is cluster target memory. And that memory, there's an instance of that memory per processing island. And what's nice about that is if you put packet data there, for example, and the, the chip will actually arrange it packet data, the head of the packet always gets delivered into the CTM memory, then it means it's very close to the CPU core. So that memory is accessible within 20 cycles. Whereas if you had something in DRAM, it might be 200 cycles to access it. So the hardware will put the head of the packet, the stuff that in packet processing you're most likely to want to read, that's going to put that in the CTM, which is nice and close and fast to access. Um, and then further still, we'll even cache, like when you read at an offset in the packet, we, we, in software we cache a bunch of that in registers. So if you do multiple reads to a packet header, you get them you know, in a single cycle. So that, that's, that's one of the things you do with the memories, and you, you might store different things in different memories depending on, on what you're trying to do. Just because of time, I want to move on. So there's this cool atomic engine in the memory unit that can do things like add values to memory, add with saturation, um, can do various tests and set, you can do swaps, locking. It's a memory command. Go lock that thing, tell me when it's locked. Content addressable lookups. Ticket release is a handy thing for reordering things, so you can actually have the memory keep track of sequence numbers for you. So you tell it, I would like to release packet number seven. Let me know when you've received packet zero through six. And then you tell the memory go, and then it, it will call you back when it's processed all the previous packets, for example. So these are useful synchronization mechanisms that you can use, that the memories actually do that work for you. It's kind of cool. I said there's a lookup engine that can do some pretty advanced lookups. So you could do a hash table lookup in a single cycle, in a single instruction. Uh, the memory may take some time to do it, but now while it's doing that, you're now executing instructions on a different packet in a different hardware thread. Um, and there's all these various types of lookups. You can do TCAM lookups. You can do prefix match and mask. That's very useful for doing IP root lookups, um, where you want to do longest prefix matching. There's hardware assist for that. Um, as I said, hash lookups. And the nice thing is you can actually compose these lookups recursively. So you can, you can have the result of a lookup cause another lookup to happen. Um, I think, I can't remember how many levels deep you can do that, but you can have the memory manage all of that for you. So you tell the memory in a single command, go do this complex lookup, swap out, start working on another packet, do some work on the other packet in another thread, and at some point the memory will signal you back saying, lookup's complete, here's the result. Okay, so that's, that's kind of cool. And then I said there's this Q engine that lets you do 
rings and work queues. Work queues are pretty cool. You can add a descriptor to a work queue, and you can add threads to a work queue. So you can add a hardware. You can say, get an item from the work queue. And if there's work on the work queue, you, you get the, the descriptor straight back. If there's not, it'll put that thread to sleep until there's work on the work queue, and then wake the thread with a signal when work arrives. So these are all automatically handled in the hardware, which is kind of cool. And these journals are pretty cool for debugging. Um, you can have a circular ring where you could write data to, and that's handy for debugging, um, usually. And also for managing buffers. If you're managing a free list of buffers, you might journal those to a ring when they become free, and then you can pop them off the ring again when you want to allocate a buffer. And there's a statistics engine in the memory that can do very cool things. In a single command, you can tell it, go and update a byte count and a packet count for these in up to 16 statistics. So you might be counting, was it a TCP packet? Was it an IPv4 packet? Was it a, you know, all these different characteristics of the packet. And with a single command, you can tell the memory, go and increment the stats for TCP, for IP, for Q number this. In one command, you can increment the stats for all of them. So that's, that's pretty cool. And the, and the op optional saturating add to on the stats as well. So that's pretty cool. So this is the, the point I'm trying to get to. This is a, a very powerful piece of hardware um, that can execute anything you want it to execute. So this is why it is very important to insist on openness of the code running on these, these processes is the point I'm trying to make. So hopefully I've given you a little bit of a a snack on what, what these things can do. Um, be aware that there, there are processes running on your network interface card that see every packet coming in and out of your machine. And when you're doing crypto offload, you're giving the crypto keys to the, the network card, saying, please encrypt and decrypt for me. So it's good that it's open source. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Questions? It sucked that badly. <laughs> yes. Yes, it, the, there have been improvements to the. Yes. <laughs> it's a, originally the NFP was derived from the the Intel IXP. I don't know if you're familiar with that part, but that, that's the genesis of this, and Netronome has been advancing it over the years. Yes. I'm not familiar with that one. It may be some. I, I'm not familiar with that product, so I, I can't really comment. But uh, it, it may be something very similar. I know a lot of a lot of NPUs are based on ARM cores, um, and that comes with. This is a. This micro engine is a core that's optimized for network processing, um, which which you know allow a optimized for silicon size, we can pack 120 of them onto a die. And, um, you know, special the, the, the memories and the architecture around it is, is what makes packet processing very, very efficient on this type of processor. Um, but, you know, other, others may have similar capabilities to do whatever you want with packets, right? And that's the, the thing you need to be concerned about. No more questions? Good. Thank you.